Welcome, dear guests. My name is Stefan Giesen. I'm the editorial director for business and economics at the Gorda. I'm extremely pleased to open this panel discussion on the topic of demand forecasting. Let me say some words about the Gorda. The Gorda is based in Berlin and is one of the oldest independent publishers in Germany with a history dating back more than 270 years. We are the leading publisher of academic content and also published books for business professionals. In total, we publish more than 1,300 new books each year next to journals and digital products. The Gorda has organized this webinar on the occasion of the launch of the book, Data Science for Supply Chain Forecasting written by Nicola Mendeput. At the moment, you can pre-order the second edition at your local bookstore or on amazon.com. The book will be published on the 22nd of March. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator of the panel, Michael Gilliland. He is the marketing manager for this forecasting software and serves on the board of directors of International Institute of Forecasters. Prior to this, Mike held forecasting and supply chain positions in the food, consumer electronics, apparel industries, and among other things, he's author of the business forecasting deal, principal editor of business forecasting, practical problems and solutions, and business forecasting, the emerging role of artificial intelligence and machine learning. His focus uh, is on translating research findings to improve forecasting practice. Welcome, Mike. The floor is yours. Right. Thank you, Stefan, and, and welcome, everyone. Uh, and please use the chat box to send us any questions. We'll get to those at the end of, the, of this presentation. Now, it's definitely an exciting time to be in forecasting as the last few years have seen researchers and practitioners take new paths to address our long-standing forecasting challenges. Uh, 2018's M4 forecasting competition opened my eye, many eyes, including my own. It's for the first time complex machine learning methods uh, and data in hybrid methods were the top performers. As a new generation of data scientists bring their skills to time series forecasting, um, we have high expectations for even more advances. But traditional demand forecasting challenges remain, even for basic things like model selection, which performance metrics to use, and how to express the uncertainty in the forecast. Just as important, there are also the process challenges when creating forecasts for use within organizations. We know that forecasts are easily biased by the politics and personal agendas of forecasting participants. And we know that organizations largely fail to adopt proven forecasting practices. In this webinar, we're going to engage in a discussion of these topics and more with our esteemed panel. First, Nicholas Vandeput is a supply chain data scientist specialized in demand forecasting and inventory optimization, which, is, which he has been teaching since 2014 in Brussels and in Paris. He founded his consultancy company, Subchains, in 2016 and co-founded SKU Science, a demand forecasting platform in 2018. He's previously published two books, Data Science for Supply Chain Forecasting in 2018 and Inventory Optimization, Models and Simulations in 2020. Edouard Trudeau is a supply chain expert with worldwide experience in retail, fast moving consumer goods and manufacturing and leading projects and teams over the last 15 years. Edouard is currently coaching supply chain leaders. He founded ABC Supply Chain to share best practices and tools with the 50,000 forecaster professionals and entrepreneurs that follow his blog, his YouTube channel, and his online school. Stefan Deco is CEO of Ahupa, a supply chain startup in Atlanta, Georgia, USA. He has a long career in all sides of supply chain across many industries. Now, Stefan, having observed the inefficiencies and chaos caused by flaws in existing software and implementations of that software, Stefan developed a new product based on probabilistic mathematics. He's now writing a textbook explaining 
probabilistic planning and forecasting. And finally, Sparrow's Macrodocus, professor at the University of Nicosia, where he is a director of its Institute for the Future and founder of the Macrodocus Open Forecasting Center. He has authored or co-authored 24 books in more than 270 articles. His book, Forecasting Methods for Management, has been translated in 12 languages, sold more than 120,000 copies. While his book, Forecasting Methods and Applications, a personal favorite of mine, has received more than 5,900 citations. Professor Macrodakis was the founding editor-in-chief of both the Journal of Forecasting and the International Journal of Forecasting, and also, we all also know him as organizer of the Macrodocus Forecasting Competition. So I think this is a great place to begin, Spiros, as, as organizer of the M competitions going back 40 years. I wonder if you could give us a recap of the findings and main insights from last year's M5. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, everybody. What I would like to do, I would like to start a little more general. I would like to start with the M competitions and then go to M5 competition. My personal feeling and be conviction is that the M competitions have basic three myths that they used to prevail in the field of forecasting. The first myth was that it was a best model. You know, some of you, you were not at the time that Bob Jenkins was the Bible of forecasting. But according to the Box Jackie's methodology, for every series, there was a best model. And we have to find this model judgmentally by observing the characteristics of this series and then fit that model to, in order to forecast. I mean, this, this, was this is probably, by what we know now, the biggest myth because as we know, there is no such a thing as best model. And what we know now is that averaging models, the assembly of models provides the best forecast. I just saw a report about comparing different models for the, for the pandemic. Again, the best model was the average. Okay. So this myth then, was destroyed by the, even before the first M competition by the Macridax and Yvonne study, but there was a tremendous, <laughs> what can we say, disagreement among the statisticians who believe very strongly that there is a best model for its time series. The second myth was that we didn't have to look at the future, if we fit the best model to the past, then we can assume that the future will be exactly like the past, and then we don't have to worry about what's going to happen in the future. We're going to have the best forecast for the future. Again, this assumption is wrong. Right now, we know, and that's one of the reasons that we got these big improvements in forecasting accuracy that you mentioned, Mike, in the M4 competition. Now we talk about separating the data into two parts, a test part, a validation part, and a test part. And it's not enough to just fit a model in the past because what is happening, we're doing a lot of overfitting. And the third myth was that each series was enough to improve forecasting accuracy. Again, this came out to be wrong because as long as we have series which are similar, then there is cross correlation between the series and we can exploit this cross correlation to improve the overall forecasting accuracy. Now, these three points, these three findings of the M competitions hold to all five M competitions. And they hold all three of them, the M5. And it, it, right now it may seem simple and may seem obvious, but it wasn't obvious. And I had 
the chance or the, uh, the being unlucky to be in London back in 1979, where I present the results of the microduction in bone study to the statisticians of this time. And there was a tremendous disagreement and we were accused that we didn't know how to run the box checkers methodology. So that's the reason we didn't get good results. And what is the biggest satisfaction for me is that not only the five M competitions, but a lot of other empirical studies have proven these three myths and the forecasting field has changed. And the forecast, the long forecasting winter ended by being able to do cross correlation and cross validation. And as a matter of fact, all of the major methods that they won the M5, that they were at top in the M5 competition were methods that they use cross validation and cross correlation to improve the forecasting accuracy. And all three of them use uh, They, were, they use averaging and the method that they use, although it was a machine learning method, it was not the most complicated machine learning method, but it was a rather simpler machine learning method. And please, Mike, if you want to ask, uh, stop me talking all the time. If you want to ask any questions, specific questions about the M competition or the M5 competition, please do it. So the, the basic, thing then is that uh, between the M, the first competition and the, and the fourth competition, there was a long forecasting winter. The methods, there were some new methods that they were being introduced, but actually the extra accuracy from these methods was minimal. There is here a question that we didn't hear the myth two and myth three. Is there a question, I think, Mike? Oh, uh, I didn't quite hear what myth two and three were. I think we'll we'll address those a little bit later. Okay. In just, yeah. We'll... Okay. So the, the major then difference in the M4 competition There is another question. I, I I will not concern with questions then at this point. Right. Yeah. We'll we'll take. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll compile those and then bring them back to the to the panel uh, later. Okay. So two things then happened in the M four competition that ended the long winter. The first was the idea that the, the two top methods. They use cross correlation to improve accuracy, to improve overall accuracy. And one of the top method use cross validation. Okay. And in my view, and some people keep asking why the results of the, of the different competitions prove that different methods are better each time. Well, the reason is that before the M4 competition, the idea of cross correlations and cross validation was not popular. And in the M4, the two methods managed to apply both of them. And in the M5 competition, all top methods use cross validation, cross correlations and combining to a great extent, okay? So, in my view, then, the major findings of the, the, the we we'll talk about six major findings about the M5 competition. Three of them is the value of flow screening, the value of cross validation, the value of combining. And the, the first and most important finding was the superiority of a simple machine learning method the light boosting machine learning method. 
again, something that we keep finding in the previous three competitions, the one, two, and three, was that simple methods were at least as accurate as complicated ones. The big advantage of simple methods is that they don't do overfitting. The problem with complex methods, at least, unless if they do a lot of cross validation, is that they do overfitting. So that was the, 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 the first four. The fifth finding was there was a tremendous difference, a, a significant difference between the machine learning methods and the statistical benchmarks. None of the statistical methods was in the top 50. Which means there are two reasons for that. One is that the statistical methods did not manage to use correctly cross-validation and cross-learning. And the other is that the M5 data was specific data it was daily data, it was for a retailer, it was something that it was not done in the previous competitions, like the M4, that it covered the whole range of domains and frequencies. And the last finding, the sixth finding in the M5 competition was that exogenous and explanatory variables were improving forecasting accuracy. Great. Excellent. Thank you. And I want to refer everyone to a forthcoming issue of the International Journal of Forecasting. That'll be a special feature on uh, results and commentary and discussion on the M5. Uh, they did something exactly like that for the M4. Highly valuable issue. And is there an idea when that'll be published, Spiros? Will that be early next year or late this year? Yeah, next year. In the okay. Middle of next year. Middle of next year. Okay, great. Um, so, well, I, I don't want, I mean, again, you know, there will be a big issue being published. All of the, not only these findings will be presented. But there will be a lot of discussion papers and a lot of commentaries. So people will be interested. We have to go and look at this yep. issue. Please look forward to that. Yeah. And um, if we could just take a moment, I know you're in the planning stages for M6, and give us a moment to preview what uh, how the M6 will differ from the previous competitions. Yeah. I think we I Maybe. think we've got a chart to show. Yeah, okay. Well, this is the 18 past forecasting competitions. And uh, in all of these competitions, the major way that uh, they were done is that with what we call the concealed data. In other words, we have a data and we keep part of this data. We don't make it available to participants and we ask them to forecast. Now, the problem with this is we cannot put judgment. We cannot reveal what this data is all about. So we did a paper about forecasting competitions, which you can find if you go to Google and you put the future of forecasting competitions, you will find this paper. And we try to find out all of the attributes, all of the characteristics of all of the past competitions. And basically, Practically all of them were concealed data. All of the competitions we keep part of the data in order to view then and evaluate the forecasting accuracy. Now, what we want to do with the M6 is to make it live. In other words, it has to be done in a way that we don't only put information about the numerical aspects of the data, but we put judgment. For instance, if we do financial forecasting, that probably the M6 would be about financial forecasting. In addition to the historical data of the financial series that we're going to use, people can put their judgment. In other words, what happened, what's going to happen to the economy? 
in addition, all of the forecasting competitions were on a single point. What we want to do is we want to have it on several points. We want to have it for a year. And instead of having one forecast, have six forecasts. And there are other things that are important that they were not used in past competitions that we're going to include into the M6. Now, one of the difficulties would be how to evaluate all of this huge amount of information, but hopefully with Kaggle, we'll be able to do it. So that we're going to have a, a forecasting competition that basically is going to be numerical, it's going to be judgmental, it's going to be point forecast and uncertainty forecast. And it's going to have a lot of other factors that we think are important for competitions. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Spiros. Uh, again, a lot of good information out there already published on the M4 and the new stuff on M5 is coming out. So please take a look at that. Now, so we've seen clearly the emergence of machine learning methods and forecasting in the, in the emerging role of the data scientist, as opposed to this more traditional demand plan or relying a few basic methods like moving averages or exponential smoothing. Um, Nicholas, in your book, your forthcoming new book, Data Science for Supply Chain Forecasting, you cover both approaches. You also advocate for applying a scientific mindset to the problem of demand forecasting. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, sure. So as Espiros explained, uh, many of you, and I received this question in many webinar class or training is, many of you are asking themselves, but what is the best method? What is the method I should apply right now for my own supply chain? Um, as Pierre said, and as each and every company, competition has shown, there is not one best method that would suit every single data set on every single horizon and so on. Instead, you have a huge toolbox that contains some simple model, some more advanced model, some statistical model, some machine learning model. Um, my book, the objective of the book is really to show to the reader how to get and how to use all these kinds of tools so that when you're facing a specific data set, you know that you can use some, well, very simple stuff like a moving average, and you can use some very advanced stuff like the neural network. At the same time, what I try to do, and that's really what I'm doing every week and every day, I'm trying to simplify every single model to really show the reader just in a few lines of code, how can you do a neural network? In a few lines of code, how can you do a gradient boosting, the kind of model that just won the competition? Because I guess that now many people are listening to this and thinking, okay, machine learning seems to be for real. It seems not just the um, marketing buzzword. So maybe I should be interested. But I have no PhD in math. I am not a geek myself. Uh, I'm not an IT person. So it sounds like I will never be able to uh, handle machine learning. And really the point of the book is to show you that in just a very few lines of your code, you can do it, and it doesn't require you to have a, a PhD. So it's really a way to show that while well, you have a huge tool doc at your disposition, and then you need to apply what you said, the, this um, scientific mindset to try each method and just keep the one that works um, best. Just to conclude this, to finish this, I like to, to ask the question to my students each time I show them a new model, I always ask them, like, what's the best model? And it's some kind of a gimmick in my class because the answer I'm expecting is that there is no best model. So the question makes no sense. And it's all about just testing different solutions and see uh, which one works best. All right, thanks. Eight. Uh, we've, we kind of started with a peek ahead to some of the exciting new findings and forecasting research uh, and what's coming ahead. But let's take a few moments now to step back to consider some of the challenges and pitfalls in the current practice of forecasting in industry. I want to start with you, Edward. From your work in consulting and coaching, what are you seeing out there that, that companies are struggling with? So thanks, Mike. So even before consulting, I, I was demand planner manager, I was a SNOP manager, and I can tell you that we are struggling. I was struggling myself with my team because one of the points is my demand planner team was not spending enough time on forecast at the beginning. Why we were not forecasting? Because we were firefighting every single day. We, had, we, had, we still have too many emails today. 
we have endless meetings, endless SNOP meetings. We have, from my point of view, we have too many, um, too, too many layers of management, too many reports in and KPI. And then we need to explain all these KPIs and root, root cause analysis for all this out of stock, especially for not significant code like C codes. And this is really challenging for us. In addition, we have this, from, from my point of view, lack of awareness around why it's important to have a good forecast accuracy to improve your inventory, your cash, your profits, and also to reduce the stress in the company. And because it's really complex to collect all this data, it's too manual, it's not, so, it's not centralized and it's not standardized, we spend way too much time. So at the end of the week, we only have 20% or maybe one day left only to forecast. I was exhausting, my team was exhausting, and we don't even have time to reflect and challenge the current model we are using. And we just repeat this cycle every, uh, every week or every month. Uh, this is really from my personal experience. I guess we have a few people like this uh, in, in this webinar today. And it's really challenging to just take a step back from the business and look at really your data. And as St. Nicolas just before, it's not that complex, but you need to spend a few hours a week just to take a step back, look at your data, compare different models, and start really thinking, how can I improve my, my forecast process? Right, Stefan, your bio mentioned seeing really the same kind of flaws and implementation mistakes being made across supply chain software implementations. Um, you also talk about firefighting issue, which Eduardo just mentioned. Uh, maybe you can add a list of struggles you see companies facing. Um, yeah, so there's, a, I think the, the primary struggle I've noticed is that there's a gap between what all the software and the math that people are using in these companies are promising versus what they're achieving. Um, I, 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 I've finally narrowed that down to the math just being too simplistic. You know, Einstein once said, uh, you gotta make things as simple as possible, but no simpler. I think we've made it simpler. And because of that, uh, you know, we, we have to bend around backwards to try and correct for that after the fact. And, uh, and I think that leads to a lot of this breaking into frozen fences, uh, rush orders into depot transfers, whatever to, to fix a hole where the, the inventory is not providing the service, for example, that it promised. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we can solve this here, but it, I mean, speculation, why aren't companies doing a better job you know, adopting the kind of research things that, you know, pro proven uh, good methods, uh, you know, particular things like M competitions, top performing methods being used in industry to some extent, because they're kind of new being seen for the first time, how well they're performing. So you can understand a bit of a time lag, but I think in general, we see a, a big failure of industry to adopt the proven good practices. Any, any speculation on that? Um, I, I think there's a couple of factors at play. I think, first of all, the industry is just slow to adopt to anything new. Um, you know, there are very few companies that want to take the lead and take risks and, and try something new. Um, I also think there's this big body of consultants and analysts and certification programs that uh, are still churning out the mainstream materials and, and promoting it and there nobody's really emphasizing that there's newer better uh, things out there that are worthwhile and I, and I think that does bring us to the m competitions i think the m competitions do uh try to move that uh, effective frontier if you will uh, and when i saw m3 i think there was a lot of um uptake of things that came out of that um and four, in, in my opinion, was a, a missed opportunity. It was too academic. There was no cross-relational information between time series that made it basically a pure academic exercise. Um, and M5, uh, that completely fixed that, but it's too recent, right? The, the companies haven't had time to, I, I think, respond yet to what, what is coming out of M5. So. I'm hopeful that we'll see, you know, in, in the next few years that a lot of the learnings from M5 will be, uh, will be adopted. Um, Stefan, thank you for, for your answer. If I may add on this, on, because it's a very interesting question to, to think like we have the competition and um, let's say the state of the art in this competition that go that far. And on the other side, we have supply chain, which still, as Edouard 
mentioned and Stefan as well are still struggling with Excel, with firefighting. And uh, within the people listening to us, I guess that most of you are within this group of people thinking, I'm still struggling on Excel. So you're talking about very advanced stuff, but like, what do I do today with this? Um, I would like to, to show some kind of ideas on how to progress from there. And I'm absolutely sure that Edouard will have more ideas on that. I, I think that today's supply chain, most of them are small data. They don't take time to capture the right data. They don't take time to store the data. And if you want to get a data set in a supply chain, it's extremely difficult. Each time I start a new project with a client, it takes weeks or months to get the data set and to clean it. So obviously, if you're extremely motivated yourself, you're a demand planner, you heard about machine learning, you're going to buy a book. I'm not going to mention name. You're going to learn how to do machine learning from this book. First thing you're going to ask is, okay, do we have a demand data set? And well, no, we don't have it. We need to take a look. It will take weeks. So you see, I think that supply chain have to learn to become data driven or at least to have good data quality. On the other hand, I think one of the enemy here is Excel. Everyone is relying on Excel and the more you are on Excel, the less data driven you are because Excel is quite good for some small data set. But if you want to go for the big shots, Excel is just too small. So I would really advise people go for big data sets, take care of your data, and maybe it's time to learn to code in Python so that you can get rid of Excel. Hey, Spiros, can you tell us a little bit about an effort you initiated regarding this issue of the usage of forecasting in organizations now known as the UFO project. I know we're all keenly interested in increasing the adoption of good practices in industry. I know you're, you're kind of leading this effort as well. Well, as you know, people in business, they're afraid to use forecasting methods because they're used to doing it. They're used to guessing rather than forecasting. They have an objective, they want to achieve this objective and say, that's the forecast. And uh, very often, and you know this very well, even if you use Excel, you can do much better than the guessing that it's done in a lot of companies that they call it forecasting. Okay. Now, what we try to do with the UFO project is to try to persuade companies, try to provide them evidence to show them what is the opportunity cost of not using some form of systematic forecasting? It doesn't have to be complicated. It, just, it can be very simple. It can be naive one and naive two. It can be very simple forms of machine learning that they can run on their own. And this is the problem. We all know very well that judgment is full of biases. We're over-optimistic. There are a lot of studies, as you know, that they try to judge the value of doing judgmental adjustments, quantitative forecast. The great majority of them are over-optimistic. So how can you persuade people, and that's the whole idea of this UFO project, how can you persuade business people to stop using their judgment, which is full of bias, and use some systematic way of forecasting? And then another thing that you also mentioned is people are unwilling to look at uncertainty because when we make forecasts, the forecasts are never going to be exact. There's going to be always going to be a big amount of uncertainty involved. So how do we take care of this uncertainty and how we manage not to completely ignore it and say it doesn't exist? Look what happens with the pandemic and what has make to his, what Trump has caused to too many companies. Yeah, that's the challenge of communicating uncertainty in the forecast is a big one. And decision makers, the users of the forecast, they don't like it when things are too uncertain and they may reject the forecast with, for example, a wide prediction interval. They just think it's not, you know, that doesn't help me at all. That's it's too much uncertainty there. Uh, this situation, you can think, kind of think of it as a forecaster's predicament because on the one hand, if you're doing this analysis, if you honestly find there's this high degree of uncertainty in the number, you should communicate it, but people are gonna think you're worthless and an idiot and incompetent because there's so much uncertainty in your forecast. So it's, it becomes a real challenge, an ethical challenge almost for the forecaster in communicating this information. I don't know, 
Edward, did you ask? Yeah, yeah, to be honest, from my point of view, I think we, we have two options. Like if you're a supply chain manager or a demand planner, you have two options. Or you wait, you wait three, four, five, ten years to have an update from your famous ERP on the on that your company is using, or you start really small. As say Nicolas before in, in his book, you start really small. You log four hours in your calendar every week, and during these four hours, you start learning and playing. You start reading a book. You start, start maybe you start an online course. You start uh, reading about the M5 competitions. Then you select few permanent products. I will not start with promotions and new products. Then you define the KPI you want to improve. There is, we, we could have a, a conference just about KPI, but just pick one KPI you want to optimize. Then you extract the, the data from your SAP or Oracle or ERP. You prepare the data. You start playing with maybe just basic statistical forecasts. And uh, Nicolas is giving few examples in, in his book. And maybe you can start with one simple model of machine learning, like linear regression or decision tree. Then you start playing, you start tracking the KPI and say, okay, I'm getting better than the current forecast we have in my SAP or NetSuite uh, ARP. You start uploading the forecast and because you have a better forecast accuracy, you will improve your service level, you will improve your inventory level, and you will be able to communicate to your board of director that you are basically, you are getting better and you, we should maybe duplicate this project to few SKUs and maybe spend more time uh, recruiting someone else to improve this model and, they, and then duplicate. And, and, and I think this is the, the, the most reason, uh, this, this, the most easy way to communicate and convince people that, yes, this is working, it's possible, and we don't have to start big, we just have to start small, play, and communicate. Okay. Uh, uh, Stefan, can you speak a little bit about the probabilistic forecasting and planning as maybe another way to deal with uncertainty? Um, sure, yeah, so the, the probabilistic perspective is basically one where you start off with the premise that there is uncertainty, whereas more of the traditional ways you generate a point forecast, whether it was through a statistical approach or a machine learning, um, you get a time series of points and then you determine what your uncertainty is around that. Uh, the probabilistic way flips that around and starts with the uncertainty. And if you want a point, well, pick a point on the, on the distribution. You want the mean, you want the median, want the mode, um, right? So it, it flips that around, but all the calculations internally use the full probabilistic information and you get better results because of it. So you get a dramatically greater um, accuracy because you're not working with averages all the way through. Um, so I think that is the, the big benefit of probabilistic. You still have the, the, the issue that you mentioned earlier, where if it comes up with a big range of uncertainty, you know, executives today don't, might not want to accept that, right? They, they might say, uh, it, how does that help me? But if that's reality, do you want to switch reality to make you feel more comfortable or do you want to see reality the way it is? Great. Hey, moving on, um, with the promise we, of, oh, sorry? No, no, we have a very good question. I'm not sure if you want to start. Um, or we can wait, it's up to you. Yeah, we've got so many questions coming in. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe just wrap up a little bit here in our okay. section here. Um, how about this one? This is one that Spiros actually brought up in a paper he published in Foresight recently is, you know, the future of the forecaster or demand planners role out there. Uh, you know, to asking, can AI and ML get so good as to make the forecaster obsolete? Uh, <laughs> any kind of speculation on on that one out there? I mean, well, what I think is very clear is that the role of forecaster has to change. You know, when we were in school, we used to learn how to calculate square roots, okay, which is interesting but useless if you can do it in three seconds. And the same thing, we're spending a lot of time doing work that can be done by the machine learning. And then we spend we have to concentrate on how to improve the quantitative forecast. What we call the, the, the judgmental adjustments to the quantitative forecast, because no matter what you do, there is information that it's not in the past data. You have to put it on top. So we have to concentrate, we have to change the role of the forecaster from doing the manual work, the mechanical work, putting extra value to, to the forecasting process. 
And don't forget that the first person that won the M5 competition was an undergraduate student taking a forecasting course for the first time, okay? And he managed to beat the 5,000 machine learning experts, okay, and grandmasters, okay? So it's not the mechanical part of forecast which is the important. What is important is what value, extra value, the forecaster can put into the process. Great. Hey. I may, yeah, if I may say something about that, my mic. I, I think, like from my point of view, and what 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 Spiro was saying before is, I, I don't think tomorrow we're going to forecast anymore. We're going to feed the machine, and the machine will forecast for us. And um, basically, we will just optimize, okay, which parameters we want to optimize. And basically, uh, the, the model will automatically pick the right model to improve the KPI one you want to improve. And yeah. the new, when we're asking, what is the new demand planner role or what this person is going to be? Uh, I'm, we're looking for a unicorn forecaster. So we, we need a quantitative mindset that really understand the mathematics and the, this, this, this complexity. But we also need someone with experience from the ground to be able to really understand the business he's working with. And we also need someone with great communication skills to be able to get the information, to feed the machine, to improve the forecast accuracy, like promotions, new products. You can't just get this information automatically, automatically right, right now because it's super challenging. We don't have the interface today to get this information and have the right attributes for every single products. So we're really looking for this superstar <laughs> i'm not sure we'll find many people like this on the market and because of that we will probably split the functions to like having like super data scientist forecaster and maybe people more more like snop project management to get all the people together the communication and, and all the the tools to improve the, the automation in the company so if, if i may add something I, I think there's a similar problem here and i, I fully agree with but what you say here and, and what Spira said as well, you, know, you, you really got to make computers do what computers are doing or best at. You got to let the humans do what the computers cannot. Um, but there's a big role here for software to not give them one extreme or the other, right? Uh, the old fashioned way of looking, you're either a standard out of the box product and it's easy for the users, but it can possibly solve your, your issues. And on the other hand, you have more of a, the statistical toolbox and uh, the expert can make that baby sing, but there's not enough experts around that every company can have enough of them. And there's a, a balance to be found in the middle where the software can take away a, a lot of the, I would say almost the mathematical side of, of things and make that more of a, an intuitive thing the, the person doesn't need to see the numbers. They might be able to interact with graphs or curves, what have you, that uh, represent the complex mathematics in a simpler way. And that then uh, reduces the need for the people that you want to hire to be more of the, the business experts, the communicators, as, as you say, uh, because finding the people that are all of that, that is really, really difficult. There's very few of them. Yeah, I think, Stefan, you're right. But... One of the things that I have found when I work with business is people are not willing to put down their forecast. They are doing judgmental forecast and they refuse to write them down so we can evaluate them after the fact, okay? And this is a problem. We have to be able to find some way to evaluate the judgmental inputs of the managers of the forecasters. Uh, to me, that just means there's still a, a work to be done for consultants, even this, in this future world. They, they still need to focus on that change management and getting rid of these bad practices. You know, it's understandable that people don't want to give up the, the, the very thing they use to game the system. But, you know, if the, if the consultants do their job well and, and, and give the right input to, to change the processes in a way that are more robust, and hopefully after maybe a decade, maybe more, you know, these kind of bad practices will start to wane. Hey, everyone. First, I want to thank, uh, just mention to the audience, thank you very much for this cha ongoing chat that's going on. It's fantastic. Dozens of questions. We're not going to be able to get to them all. But before we get into those, I just want one last question of the panelists and just how do we get started? Maybe each of you 
let us know, do we need to hire consultants to go to training? Where can we give more information on next steps? I mean, I would just like to mention a forthcoming um, book I compiled with Len Tashman, editor of Foresight, and my colleague Udo Slavo, Business Forecasting, the Emerging Role of Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning. That'll be coming out in April. That's got about 60 articles and in, in, in commentaries deal, dealing with a lot of these uh, important issues. Um, Nicholas, what do you recommend? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mike. I think what kind of first step you do is not what's the most important. The most important thing is that you got to do a first step. As said, machine learning is the future. Will it solve all problems? No, but it's going to help you. You can go back to university, you can go follow online classes, you can read books, you can follow training, you can hire a consultant, you can try to do it yourself. What's very important is just to get yourself started. And I really want to stress the message, and, and, and most of the panelists will do the same, is that you can do it. And what's important is just to get some uh, traction. Great. Uh, Stefan, I know you've got a book coming out at some point uh, later on you're working on, and also you're very active on LinkedIn and online you know, where people can meet up with you for, for discussion on these kind of things. Yeah, yeah. So the, the book is, uh, that's my flexible timeline. So as time allows between all the work, other work that I do, I write on the book. Um, it has a fixed content, but a, a flexible timeline. Uh, so it's probably going to be a year until it's fully published. Uh, you know, there's multiple steps to, to be done. I'm probably halfway, it, it, it's looking to be like a 600 page book and I'm 300 pages. Oh. So it's, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I still have some work to do. Right. Um, but yeah, on LinkedIn, that's where, that's where I'm active. And uh, I, I publish some excerpts there uh, when there's interesting parts that, that may be topical at the moment. Great, awesome. And Spiros, I know you, you offer training through the MOFC. You've also got the M5 conference coming up. Things you'd like to share with the audience about where they can get started and more information. Well, there's a lot of information if they go to the site of uh, MOFSC, the Macadike Shopping Forecasting Center. And there they, they can find all of, the, all of the things we're talking there, there in there. Now, what I concentrate a lot currently is the M6 competition. We're spending a lot of money in the stock market for investing. And what I would like to know is, are there some people who are consistently better in investing than others? How much of this is due to doing very good forecast and how much of this is appreciating uncertainty correctly? So the M6 would be about these three things. And hopefully it's going to be run and our hope is to be able to get a lot of uh, prizes because it's going to be for, for a whole year and having people motivated, we have to be able to have big prizes so that they can continue doing the competition. Great, great, thank you. And Edward, I know you do your, your coaching. Can you tell us a little bit about that? No, yeah, people can join me, uh, join me on uh, my blog, abcsupplation.com, on my YouTube channel, and uh, on LinkedIn. And as I said, uh, Nicolas, before, I think I really agree that people we just need to start anywhere. And the first step is really important. Uh, for some people, it will be just to read a book or just to spend one hour a week uh, uh, trying a new model on, on Excel. And for some people, it will be uh, recruiting a consultant or starting a, an online course. But this is just... We need to increase, my focus basically with AV supply chain is just to increase awareness and education and build the foundations for the future of the supply chain and machine learning is definitely the future. It's already the present for few companies only, but for sure it's the future for most of them in the, in the next few years. Awesome. Well, again, uh, audience, this is your time and I'm glad you've taken good advantage of it. Uh, first question I want to have is, is there a trade-off between accuracy and computational time for different forecasting techniques? Is it quantifiable and can it be used in practice? So uh, yeah, to, to answer this question, um, as for any project, especially with forecasting, you can always come up with a more complex model with just multiple, I'm not gonna go into detail, but basically with machine learning, if instead of running it once, you run, it, you run your model 10 times, you might get 
a few extra percent of accuracy. Again, I'm not going to go into technicalities. But it means that if you're willing to run your model for two days instead of just one hour, you might get to a better result. Again, I am not really advising that every single supply chain should run a model over five or 15 days just to get you know, this very small extra accuracy. Instead, it's more like a management choice to understand, OK, we have a certain model with this level of complexity. It takes this much of time to run. We got this accuracy. We're happy. And we know that if we get, we want to get this 0.1 extra percent, we can just increase slightly complexity, double the computation time, and then we can go for a bit more. But you cannot know this in advance. You first need to come up with the model and the data set. Okay. I know in the M4, they published a really interesting table of the run times of, of the algorithms, you know, ranging from under a minute to run 100,000 series for a naive model to uh, six days and 32 days for the two, uh, actually the top performing models, but just show, you know, it, is at this point that wouldn't be practical for a real life situation, but uh, it, it's really useful to see that comparison. Uh, another question, can machine learning be beneficial in other areas of supply chain like sourcing or inventory management? Is there been any work on that? Um, I'll just give my own opinion here. Uh, machine learning is a growing field. You have new technology every year. You get new methods, you get new models, you get new best practices. So whatever the answer to your question is right now in 2021, in 2023, we might find some new ideas. Of course, you have things for inventory optimization. You can use an artificial intelligence to make order for you. You can use some machine learning to assess if your supplier is reliable, if your client is going to pay you in time. You can use machine learning to optimize your warehouse, robot to scan thing. It's, it's endless. Great. Hey, and I want to, I think all you panelists have the chat windows open. Um, please go in there and maybe you can help me out finding appropriate ones that, that pick out ones that you'd like to answer. Um, Maybe this one, uh, let's, uh, what are the current gaps in studies done with mean, machine learning in the field of demand forecasting? What needs to be done to address the gaps in, in, in the studies? And maybe Stefan, you wouldn't mind to mention probabilistic forecasting here? The gaps, sorry, I was reading another question. Um, what, what was the specific question you were referring to with gaps in the studies? Yeah, I think it, we can phrase it for you in terms of, you know, is there much study done on these, these probabilistic forecasting? You know, there's not a, not, you know, certainly not nearly as much literature on that as more traditional areas. So, um, uh, well, I, I, for, I've been to a, um, a foresight conference and this was uh, you know, two years ago when they were still in person. Uh, this was the one in, in Boulder. And I was surprised there were maybe, you know, 150 uh, presentations and about a hundred of them were about, about probabilistic methods. And I was, my mind was blown. I didn't know there was that much going on uh, in the probabilistic field. If you search online, you barely find anything. And then you go to these conferences and you find that at least in the academics, uh, the, a lot of this stuff is happening. So it, it makes me, uh, feel good that I think that it's going to start flowing into business. We're not seeing it yet. Uh, not enough in the literature yet. Um, I'm definitely trying to contribute and at least add one piece of literature there. But uh, no, I think it's just a matter of time. It's uh, but yeah, there's not there's not much there yet to cross that gap. Unfortunately, it's uh, and 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 it's um, partly caused, I think, by a fear and partly caused by misunderstanding. So um, statistical methods are already really difficult for many people. And uh, taking it a notch more sophisticated is, you know, is scary. Um, but also I think a lot of the experts in the field, the statistical apps, experts haven't fully um, grasped yet 
what makes uh, the probabilistic approach fundamentally different, right? Why, why it works better, why you're not no longer shaving 0.1% accuracy off, but you're shaving 20% off, um, right? And, and that is because you're, you're really getting rid of a fundamental flaw, but that, that realization hasn't been made yet. If, if I may add something here on the question of should we investigate a new field on demand forecasting in terms of science and theory, I, I think that what supply chain people need today is not more theory, more research. Mm -hmm. What they need is more application, more things that work, more things that they can do next week or next month, right? We have currently such a huge gap between the people that won M5 competition and came up with very advanced machine learning model. And at the same time, on the other side of the spectrum, so many demand planners still relying on Excel or relying on moving average. So these people to get out of Excel and moving average, they don't need that the leaders of the M5 come up with even more advanced stuff. No, they don't need this. They just need that we explain in more simple terms, in more actionable ways on how they can get started. And that's also the, the, the work of my life as it's most of the panelists here trying to bring these kind of very advanced ID to most of supply chain. Just not, let's just not leave that for Amazon or Walmart or these kind of players. Let's just bring these good ideas and models down to every single supply chain. This is what really what we are after. Yeah, and I think there's only two kinds of offerings there in the space today. And one of them is all that uh, early uh, innovational work that's happening. And uh, you know that is just really hard to get started with in a commercial environment. Um, and the other ones, there's a number of commercial software out there that already do this. In fact, uh, some uh, have started doing this as early as 1978. So it's been around and been used by many uh, Fortune 500 companies in the world, but it's expensive, right? It's, it's not Excel. Um, so really, you only have the two extremes, you know, uh, dig deep into your uh, wallet or uh, build it yourself and it's it's too complex at this stage for that there's there's no budget options available that make it insightful for uh, the smaller companies or the individual that wants to learn more at this point hey we're coming up on the top of the hour i think uh most of the panels will be able to stick around for a few extra minutes although i know some of you panelists and audience may have to leave but so we're going to stay around for a few extra minutes here um, here, here's a question. Most of the firefighting is often generated from products in intermittent, with intermittent and lumping demand to generate ripples in the plan. Any suggestion on how to tackle these type of products? And I'm going to take a quick stab at that is, you know, sometimes we just have to be open to alternative solutions that are really outside of forecasting to address the forecasting problem. And one of them is simply pruning items, uh, if possible. A company I worked with many years ago, we found that just did a simple Pareto chart and found 25% of the products did one half of 1% of the total revenue. And these products generally had substitutes, that sort of thing, it wasn't a huge deal. Although it did take some pulling of teeth to get salespeople to agree to prune these products. So we got rid of 25% of the portfolio. We didn't lose any revenue. In fact, we ultimately had a much better year the next year. Uh, I think largely because we can focus on higher volume things, things that we can manage better. And so it's always best, it's always the easiest way to eliminate forecast errors is to just get rid of the need to forecast those kind of things. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if anybody else had anything yeah, on that so, one. No, so I think there's two parts to that. One is for sure, you gotta be smarter about what you keep in your portfolio and how you deal with it, right? There's just no, no need to keep a, a portfolio that big with that many options, but you know my uh, my go to the probabilistic approach. That's actually its strength is in the intermittency. So uh, the the more intermittent demand becomes, the more accurate compared, relatively speaking, to the traditional methods, uh, the probabilistic forecast gets because it doesn't assume that normal distribution, and a deterministic demand is basically a different shape distribution. So. Uh, suddenly it doesn't become a question of forecast accuracy. It becomes a question of how do you choose in a business uh, uh, way, what to do with this information about the efficiency of servicing a product. Uh, so it changes the discussion. 
Uh, I, I totally agree, Stefan. Uh, and I think that in supply chain, we don't, we definitely don't challenge enough marketing sales. We get this forecast from uh, from the marketing. We have ten new products. We're going to do plus hundred percent, but in the reality, we we won't. We will do only plus five percent. And yes, for sure, we need to have more statistical or pro pro probabilistic models to prove that this is basically the marketing input is wrong, and mm -hmm. or is not accurate. And, uh, but for sure, even before thinking of forecasting, we, uh, we, we, need to, uh, to, we need to take much more leadership in the forecasting and SNP, and SNP process to just not only accepting, but challenging and reviewing or canceling any products that won't be profitable for the company. Right. Uh, here's, here's one a little bit of a turn. Have you explored using Bayesian statistics to deal with uncertainty? Anybody uh -huh. on that one? Yeah. Okay. So I don't use it for everything, but uh, you know when you're uh, dealing with uh, conditions like new product introductions, uh, where you have very little history, you can basically start off with a prior assumption and then fine tune it after that. Uh, once you have you know a, a sufficient history, there's very little need to add the complexity of of base and statistics, at least at the 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 approach of using full distributions, that's an extra dimension of complexity that you, you can avoid by not doing it. But there are certainly uh, cases where you want to do that. And I guess more questions for more guidance on starting these kind of big projects, you know, machine learning plus supply chain. Uh, it's because it's not just a problem of algorithms. It's a problem with IT, the infrastructure and IT management. Uh, any experience dealing with that? Um, again, I, I think, and I would be very curious to hear after the opinion of Edouard on this. Most of the issue will be collecting a demand and getting a demand data set. But once you get this, and that's really what I try to, to show and to teach you people is that running the algorithm yourself you can do that easily in Python uh, or in other language, actually, not just Python. And some of them, not all, are coming for free. You can run them on your own laptop, on your own desktop. So you can really do something rather simple on your own computer nearly for free, right? So this creating the algorithm part, it's not what I'm concerned about. I'm more concerned about we need to collect uh, demand. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Nicola. We need to centralize and standardize as much as possible. If like for new product promotion baseline, the more we standardize, it's really obvious what I say, but in most of the companies, just for new products or promotions, we have different spreadsheet that we send per, per email. Even just having the new codes, the, the correct list for the new codes coming next season, it's a real challenge. So, and if we can uh, standardize and also standardize all the attributes of the promotion and the new products and the baseline, it's, it's pretty simple in, in machine learning or any kind of models because the models find, will find by itself what is the best way to improve the forecast accuracy and of obviously the, the, the service level and, and the, the level of inventory. But we need these people to connect and explain to marketing, sales, finance, why it's important to have this specific format and always the same format and always at the same sequence to make sure we can use it and fit the machine. Mike, here's a question. It says, it appears that like companies don't really focus on forecasting. What would be the reasons behind that? Well, companies don't know the value of forecasting. I think part of what we must do as forecasters is try to show them how much they lose by not applying forecasting. Even in companies, if you take the marketing people and you ask them to forecast, and then you ask the same thing to production people, you get forecasts which are completely different. And the marketing people want to produce as much as possible. The production people want to produce as little as possible. And it shows what is the value, what is the importance of biases, and what quantitative, what systematic forecasting does, it's a, way, a good way to start, a good way to avoid these biases. Okay. And this is, as you know, what we try to do with the UFO project, try to establish some way to provide as objective forecast as possible and try to persuade companies what's the value of, the, of this objective forecast. Sometimes a very educational effort, just go in and just 
assuming they've got the forecast recorded somewhere, either the statistical or judgmental, both preferably, and just compare those to a naive forecast and just see how has this company been doing. And it's often shocking for these companies to see how poorly, you know, they've been spending all this time and effort on forecasting. And they could have done just as well or better doing nothing and just using, you know, the naive forecast. The last, the last observed actual. Steve Morley just, you know, found companies 30 to 50% of their forecasts are less accurate than the naive. Yeah, so yeah. sometimes it just just measuring that, showing that to people, that maybe is the slap in the face that that you know maybe needed to wake them up, and then using something you know like forecast value added, which I advocate to compare. Well, what is your improvement versus the naive? What you know, how much value does your statistical model add? How much value does your judgmental overrides add? And just exposing that for the first time, mostly, to see where the real problems are. If you can pressure people to write down their judgmental adjustments, yeah. what they are, right? Which they don't do. Let's end with one last question. I, uh, I will have, oh, I'm sorry, I will have to, um, to say goodbye but, because uh, oh, okay. I'm expecting me actually to give a training on uh, machine learning and demand forecasting, okay. right? So I'm already a bit training late. I wanted to, to thank so all, all the panelists and all the, the people asking questions. It has been a, a pleasure for me to uh, discussing with you and uh, answering a uh, question. Uh, a last one on my side, you know, I'm trying to show it back. Many people ask me, Nicola, what, what's, what's this uh, painting on your book and what does it really represent for you? I, I think this panel discussion is really a representation of what the, the school of uh, Athens is about. It's about uh, scientific discussing uh, demand forecasting, obviously. So I wish you all a, a great day. I hope to see you on LinkedIn to discuss more. Uh, very interesting model. It was my pleasure to, to, be, uh, to be here with you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, also many thanks also from my side for the wonderful and informative uh, webinar and the audience for the interesting questions, the panelists for the great insights and Mike for the excellent moderation, thanks. Um, as you heard, the webinar is also being recorded. You will find the video on our YouTube channel, also YouTube recorder at the end of the week. Uh, I wish you all a good evening, afternoon or morning, depending where you are. Goodbye and take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. See you soon.